Welcome to today's Senate occasional lecture. I'm Jackie Morris and I'm the Clerk Assistant Procedure in the Department of the Senate. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people who are the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today and their elders past and present. In 1943, Dorothy Tangney and Edith Lyons made history as the first women elected to the Australian Parliament. Lyons as the member for the Tasmanian seat of Darwin and Tangney as a senator for Western Australia. Their arrival in Canberra 41 years after women had gained the right to vote and to stand for Parliament received considerable media coverage. However, much of it focused on their appearance and on the novelty of women being in Parliament. Since then, 207 women have entered Parliament and currently there are 45 women in the House of Representatives and 30 in the Senate. In today's lecture, Amy Mullins will consider how things have changed for women in political leadership or not, and, in the 70, and look at the 75 years since Tangney and Lyons took their places in the Parliament. Amy describes herself as passionate about women in leadership and gender diversity. She's a broadcaster and political commentator, a member of the Ministerial Council on Women's Equality in Victoria. And until recently, she was the Executive Director of the Women's Leadership Institute Australia, where she helped shape the Institute's Pathways to Politics program for women. Would you please welcome uh, Amy to the lecture? Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for inviting me to do this lecture because um, I jumped at the opportunity when I saw that what the topic was um, and I was also really excited because one of my friends is um, the granddaughter of Enid Lyons, Libby Lyons, who's the director of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, so she's doing some great uh, work for women as well. So that's really good to see that it's continuing down the family line. So good afternoon to you all. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people and the Nambi people and their elders past, present and emerging. And uh, I also want to acknowledge any uh, parliamentarians or people in uh, politics, public service, the academic community, the wider community. I really appreciate you coming today, anyone who's listening online. Um, it's really great to see, in fact, a lot of men in the room too. Thank you for coming um, because these women had a lot of male allies and that's why they got so far as well. So it's really a partnership um, to achieve gender equality. So as I said, I'm delighted to be delivering today's Senate occasional lecture, which is to mark the 75th anniversary of the first women elected to Australia's federal parliament. These are women that I've got to know over the past few months from reading the primary sources that they left behind, even up to yesterday at the National Library, uh, looking through boxes of archives of Dorothy's uh, papers, which was fascinating to see, and it had her handwritten speeches and uh, a lot of other really great, um, uh, great things that aren't said yet in secondary sources. So I'm hoping to share some of that with you today, which is hopefully be new to you. I'm only more admiring of these women's achievements and particularly their strength of character in such difficult circumstances after reading about their experiences. And as we've just heard, uh, these women I'm speaking about is Damienid Lyons, MP, who was elected as the member for Darwin, which is in Tasmania, first for the United Australia Party and then later uh, in 1945 when the Liberal Party of Australia was formed under Robert Menzies. The other woman that we speak of is Dame Dorothy Tangney, who was elected as a Senator for Western Australia for the Australian Labor Party. To state the obvious, these women were trailblazers. What is particularly remarkable about their position in history though, is that Australian women were first granted the right to vote and stand for federal parliament in 1902 through the Commonwealth Franchise Act. And yet it took 41 years 
to see women elected as members and senators of our federal parliament. I really did have to double check. I looked it up again to make sure because 41 years seems like a very long time. Senator Tangney noted in 1949 that, quote, people regarded Dame Enid Lyons and myself as oddities when we entered parliament, but they have got used to us now. It's tough being the first for anything, but I can only imagine how daunting it would have been to enter a parliament that had been entirely male for decades. A parliament that waited until 1974 to build a ladies' toilet for female parliamentarians, which was in fact built around a men's urinal with a conspicuously covered wooden box over the top. It's still there, I just checked yesterday. <laughs> During their terms in office, Dame Enid and Senator Tangney had to use the bathroom allocated for female service staff. Toilets for female parliamentarians weren't foreseen in the 1920s when the original parliament house was being built. And this is despite the fact that, as I said, women had stood, had had the right to stand and had actually stood as candidates for federal parliament since 1903, so the year after. Just like their successes though, Lyons and Tagney did not appear in a vacuum. Many women were active political participants before and after Federation. And so the story of women's political participation and leadership is one I'm going to recount today. I will highlight some of the important features of women's involvement in politics, although in a lecture like this, it will be impossible to be exhaustive and I won't attempt that. So with that in mind, I've selected some key moments in time that I believe will be illuminating for us today. And I hope that it will help indicate where we've come from, what has changed and what has remained the same. And I think probably the latter is the more important part. But first, I would like to share with you some of the role models that paved the way for the first women to enter state and federal parliaments. One such, oh, I'm on the wrong slide too. Let's go back to the right slide. There we go. One such role model was the Scottish born South Australian social and political reformer, Catherine Helen Spence. Spence was the first female political candidate in Australia to stand for public office. That is for the, for the Australasian Federal Convention in 1897. Spence wanted to be one of 10 delegates to represent South Australia at one of the key negotiations for Australia's colonies to become a federation. Out of 33 candidates, Catherine Helen Spence came in 22nd place. In 1909, Spence chaired the meeting which formed the South Australian branch of the Women's Non-Party Political Association. And that ultimately became the Women's Electoral Lobby, which you may know of. Another enduring and prominent role model for aspiring female parliamentarians was suffragette, suffragette or as they say in Australia, suffragist, feminist, pacifist, and political activist, Vita Goldstein. In 1904, the women's gossip columnist for Brisbane's Telegraph newspaper described Goldstein as, quote, both young and smart, she dresses well, and she's quite the last person you would imagine to be the political woman advocator. The columnist goes on to add that, she is a good needlewoman, for during our chat, she was working at a charming and novel tea cloth. Her opinions are firm, her ideas and ideals excellent and not exaggerated. This column highlights two widely acknowledged and differing qualities that I think gave Vita Goldstein a significant edge as a female political candidate of her time. Some would say she even made an effort to emphasize them as she herself noted that during her political campaigning, quote, the general idea of the political woman in the past, that of the shrieking sisterhood, was perhaps the greatest force which I had to break down. And shrieking sisterhood came up many, many times. <laughs> 
Goldstein was overtly feminine in dress and attributes. She had a flair for stereotypically female activities, thereby abiding by the gender norms and expectations of the time. What is even more compelling is that she was also noted by her contemporaries for being particularly articulate, witty, sharp and well-reasoned in her political arguments and town hall speeches. Vita spoke not only on women's rights and children's rights, but she was also one of the key Victorians alongside the likes of Catholic Archbishop of Melbourne, Daniel Mannix, who publicly spoke out in favour of pacifism in what was a particularly fraught and divisive time in Australian history during World War I. She was also importantly a very prominent anti-conscription campaigner and put her own welfare at risk um, when things got violent. Vita Goldstein was one of four women to be the first female candidates to contest an Australian federal election. She ran for the Senate in 1903, as did Nellie Martell and Mary Moore Bentley. The first woman to contest a seat in the House of Representatives was Selena Anderson, and she did so in 1903 as well. Impressively, Vida remained undeterred when she lost each election, as the praise and substantial votes she received buoyed her and showed that she was slowly chipping away at attitudes towards women and their assumed primary role in private family life, as opposed to a potential role in public life. These were roles that had long been socialised into men and women and continue to some extent today. A sign of the times and her resolve, Vida Goldstein's newspaper, The Woman Voter, stated just after her election loss in 1914 for the seat of Kuyong, quote, everything seems to show that the women particularly had strong political convictions, which it will take time and work to overthrow. In the same turn, the newspaper claimed that, quote, during this election, the eyes of thousands of women have been opened. And I might add, that was especially so on the issue of unequal divorce law, which Goldstein campaigned very heavily on and sought to wedge her political campaign opponent on. For someone who lost each of her elections, albeit with a very decent proportion of votes received, one might wonder how and why Vita Goldstein maintained her steely resolve. Not only was it that Goldstein saw great social and educational value in the election campaigns themselves, but she was prescient and wise to realise the long-term potential for progress. When asked in an interview in 1910 as to whether she was going to stand for election again, Goldstein answered, certainly if all is well. It may be that I am only to be a pioneer, blazing a track for other women. If so, I am content. Already the people of Australia are accustomed to the possibility of women taking a place in their, natural par in their national parliament. She couldn't have been more correct. And those really small movements towards progress and change are actually hard to measure, but very important. What became clear, though, is that the widely held theory that once women were enfranchised with the vote, they would vote for female candidates in large numbers was most certainly not the case. Women did not necessarily vote for other women. As historian Claire Wright has observed regarding this particularly early period of female political candidature, women voted more along class than gender lines. And although Goldstein commented in 1910 that once men, quote, realised that I did not wish them swept off the face of the earth, they became more tolerant. There were plenty of men who were not as, uncom who were not as co comfortable with the situation and showed it to varying degrees. Melbourne's Punch newspaper editorialised in 1909 with a headline, The Parliament of Women. In 
commenting on and warning against the rise of the Women's Political Association of Victoria, of which Vita Goldstein was the president. The Punch newspaper said, quote, not content with equaling man, it aims to outstrip him. And the time is drawing near when the wretched fellow who is not willing to give up his seat in a tram or train to a lady may be coldly requested to give her his seat in parliament. <laughs> it certainly is rude to have your seat taken away from you. <laughs> or is that just politics? The punch had form on this issue. 45 years prior, in the year of 1864, to be precise, they had opined with great snark that, quote, as the ladies have taken to masculine habits, might they not take all our masculine business off our hands and give us a seven years spell of holiday? Delicious glimpse of paradise. Think of a female chief secretary presiding over a female cabinet and unfolding her policy to a female assembly. While female reporters recorded the fluent speeches of the charming orators in the prettiest of shorthand, and female editors indicted brilliant articles to be set up by female compositors and worked off by female machinists. Foretaste of Eden. The year of this punch editorial was no coincidence. In 1863, some Victorian women were accidentally enfranchised with the right to vote. In particular, through the Electoral Act, when, quote, the government decided that the municipal electoral rolls would be used as a basis for compiling the state electoral rolls. But what Victorian legislators failed to realise was that some women were property owners and as such were registered to vote in local government elections. It is not known precisely how many, but some of these eligible women recognised their inadvertently legislated right to vote and exercised it at the next Legislative Assembly election in Victoria in 1864. The Argus reported at the time, quote, at one of the polling booths in the Castlemaine district, a novel sight was witnessed. A coach filled with ladies drove up and the fair occupants alighted and recorded their votes to a man for a bachelor candidate. At the Sandhurst election also, the fair sex to the number of 10 or a dozen exercised the franchise and recorded their votes for their favourite candidates. Unsurprisingly, this progressive accident that gave some, but not all Victor Victorian women's the vote was reversed. Sadly, the reason given was, quote, women had not obtained it through deliberate intention. Women won the right to vote and stand for state parliament at varying times, and that vote was hard won. South Australia, was first in 1895, and Catherine Helen Spence was important in that. But Victoria, ironically, was the last in 1908. It's an important reminder that state politics was and still is an important arena for female politicians, not the least of which is because the location of the parliament is in one's home state. The first woman elected to any parliament in Australia was Edith Cowan. She was elected as the Nationalist Member for West Perth in the Legislative Assembly of the Western Australian Parliament in 1921. The women who followed her into the other state parliaments before 1943 were Millicent Preston and Mary Alice Holman in 1925, Irene Longman in 1929, Ellen Webster and Catherine Green in 1931, Lady Millie Peacock in 1933, Ivy Lavinia Webber in 1937, Fanny Eileen Brownbill in 1938, and Mary Lily May Quirk in 1939. Of the four women who entered state parliaments 
in the 1920s. Three were nationalists and one was of the Australian Labor Party. I am reluctant to point out, as I mentioned before, that practicalities such as travel weighed on women at that time who, if they were married and or had children, took on the vast majority of domestic and caring duties. Regular trips to Canberra as a federal politician were and still are one of the many challenges posed for all politicians, but this was a challenge that women felt more harshly. That said, these challenges were not insurmountable and I'm going to speak about those more soon. Women's political activism and leadership in the late 19th and early 20th centuries came in many forms, not only political candidacy. In fact, a great many number of women were engaged in politics across the political spectrum and their engagement in an organised way steadily increased from the moment women won the right to vote and stand for elected office. And I should just note that New Zealand was the first country to win the right to vote for women, but we were the first country to win both the right to vote and the right to stand. So not that it's a competition, <laughs> but it is. We're going backwards, sorry. As especially prominent, sorry, an especially prominent and influential women's organisation, which you may have heard of, was the Australian Women's National League, the AWNL, a thorn in the side of many who disagreed with them, including Vita Goldstein and Prime Minister Alfred Deakin. In September 1912, Deakin writes in his diary, quote, the ultra Tories of this state through the Constitutional Union and the AWNL has continued to exasperate and harass me day by day. So far, single-handedly, I have beat them and kept them at bay. It is because my position is so unquestioned and my retention of the leadership so universally accepted that I continue to keep them at bay. But how long can this last? Clearly, he was wearing thin. The AWNL was founded in Geelong in 1904 after a successful experimental body had been set up in 1903 by a brand of the Victorian Employers Federation. It was established to harness the strength of women voters, to educate women on politics, and as Liberal Member of Parliament in Victoria, Margaret Fitzherbert wrote, it was also based on the, quote, radical premise that women were best organised politically by other women. The League was politically conservative and undertook its activities as a, quote, matter of duty to the nation so that women would use consciously and intelligently the vote the country has given them. After seven years, the League had amassed a membership of 25,000 Victorian women and by the late 1930s, their membership had almost doubled to 50,000. Now that's a pretty effective lobby group and campaigning group just on numbers. The League was so conservative that it was a strongly debated topic as to whether women should be parliamentarians at all. However, a more moderate force, who you may have also heard of, Elizabeth Couchman, became president of this AWNL in May 20, 1927 and, quote, immediately set about promoting female members by asking women in different constituencies to forward names of likely candidates for pre-selection. The AWNL was to merge into the Robert Menzies newly formed Liberal Party of Australia in 1945. And the AWNL's massive influence led to advances in the Victorian branch of the organisational Liberal Party, which, according to Liberal Senator Margaret Guilfoyle, ensured, quote, 
equal representation of men and women at all levels of the party and in all functions of the party. In essence, quotas. There were many active women's political organisations, of which the AWNL, the Women's Liberal League of New South Wales, the National Council of Women, the Women's Peace Army, the New South Wales Political Labor League, later known as the Labor Women, Women's Committee, and the Women's Service Guild are just a few. These groups and others played a critical role in supporting and engaging with politically inclined women and, in particular, female political aspirants, providing them with campaigning experience, crucial fundraising activities, and in some cases, influence in the pre-selection process. I was interested to read that women were significant in the influential, uh, in the pre-selection process of William McMahon for his seat. He was basically ordained by the women to be running for, as a candidate instead of someone else who had been slated. Between 1903 and 1943, 26 women stood for election to Australia's federal parliaments across both houses. Well, this was no doubt due in some part to the rich women's political activity taking place at this point in history. The fact that women were unsuccessful election after election attracted criticism of the two major parties, even from some of their own. Dr. Marion Phillips, the first Australian woman elected to a national parliament, the British House of Commons to be precise, said in 1929 upon the election of a Scullin Labor government, quote, I have only one criticism to offer regarding the Australian Labor victory. I have not yet seen the record of a Labor woman's success. A Labor government without a woman in cabinet or a Labor party without a woman on the benches is still incomplete. In the 1943 federal election, 23 female candidates ran for parliament, 18 of them as independents. It took until that year, 1943, for the two remarkable women we are recognising today to be elected to federal parliament. After 41 years of attempts, victory could not have been sweeter, both for the women, but also for all Australian women, and I'm sure men. As I said earlier, Dame Enid Lyons and Dame Dorothy Tangney did not emerge out of nowhere. They had been politically active for decades before their election to federal parliament, and they were both aligned to a major party. Lyons with the United Australia Party, as I said earlier, then in 1945 with the Liberal Party of Australia, and Tangney with the Australian Labor Party. It's also interesting to note that most women prior to those um, elections federally ran as independents and were particularly cautious to align themselves with a party machine and politics for fear that it might compromise their morals and ethics and that they may be forced into uh, things that they couldn't possibly stand for that were more about the politicking rather than the benefit of the nation. Dame Enid Lyons, I'm gonna see, that's Dorothy, that's Enid. Dame Enid Lyons was no stranger to public life. Her late husband, Joseph Lyons, or Joe, as she called him, was Prime Minister of Australia for seven years, from 1932 to 1939. Dame Enid spoke of the fact that, quote, Joe and I were a partnership in marriage, and it was a real partnership. It was before the days of women's liberation, but Joe had always been a great believer in women and women's abilities and women's political rights and women's value to the community. The Lyons family were political through and through. Earlier on, in 1925, Enid's mother, 
was a candidate for parliament in the Tasmanian state election. At a time when Enid says, quote, I was also a candidate for Denison, and I suppose it was the first time, probably the only time in the history of the world where a man, his wife, and his mother-in-law were all candidates in the one election. Thankfully not contesting the same seats. <laughs> Lyons got within 60 votes, and I'm talking about Enid Lyons, of becoming the member for Denison in the seat, sorry, the seat of Denison, and that was in the Tasmanian House of Assembly. And at the time there, it was proportional representation. His, sorry, Joseph Lyons' mother-in-law, Enid Lyons' mother, Eliza Burnell, was unfortunately unsuccessful in the seat of Darwin, which was in Tasmania. Interestingly though, Joseph Lyons won his seat and continued to be Premier of Tasmania for many more years and then later Prime Minister of Australia. And I'm going to go back here. Um, I don't know if you can see, but the woman there, there's not many men, um, that is Dorothy Tangney. Dame Dorothy Tangney held a Bachelor of Arts and a Diploma of Education from the University of Western Australia. She then became a school teacher in Perth. As her biographer Connie Hooker writes, quote, she came from a strongly labour-minded family with her father a member of the Engine Drivers and Firemen's Union and her mother a staunch supporter of the labour movement. She was twice endorsed to contest the state seat of Nedlands in the West Australian Parliament, first in 1936 and later in 1939. Tangney lost to Norbert Keenan both times in what was considered to be a blue ribbon nationalist, later liberal, electorate. After running for election in an unwinnable state seat twice, Dorothy Tangney was pre-selected by the ALP in Western Australia to run for the Federal Senate. However, Dorothy was fourth on the ballot and the party only expected the first three candidates to succeed. Interestingly, Dorothy was elected to fill an unexpected casual vacancy and thus she took her place in Parliament among her Labor colleagues at age 36. Many people noted that she was unmarried and childless. It was no accident the next time around that Dorothy was number one on Labor's Senate ballot for Western Australia. She became very popular and in the 1946 election, Tangney achieved even more firsts, including being the first person since Federation to gain an absolute majority of the votes in a Senate election in Western Australia. The total number of primary votes she received was 137,777. That was the record for any individual candidate in any election in Western Australia. This highlights yet another important point for women in politics, that one must not lose hope if one loses the first time around. For many women and men to a somewhat lesser degree, Women must generally run a few or more times before they are elected, even before they are pre-selected. That is often because women were and still are less likely to be pre-selected for safe or winnable seats. It also demonstrates that women, especially those who are the first of anything, are usually exceptionally talented individuals who have needed to have higher qualifications greater skills and a significant work ethic in order to compete with their male colleagues. In order, for example, for the dominant group, in this case men, to take a risk on a woman. Both women were certainly never in want of merit. In 
and yet they faced obstacles and arguably, I would add, never given roles commensurate with their experience, skill set and status. Both women, sorry, Enid, as you would know, and she said before, was an equal partner to her husband, Joe, and she was campaigning with him for every election that he stood and gave public speeches regularly off the cuff. So she had been training for this career her entire life as the First Lady and as the wife of Joseph Lyons. Dame Enid Lyons became the first woman to serve in federal cabinet, albeit without a portfolio. I'm still not sure how that happens. It had been widely reported and expected in the press that she was likely to receive a cabinet and thus ministerial posting. In her autobiography, Among the Carrion Crows, which by the way is a quote from um, Billy Hughes, who said that she was basically a beautiful bird among many crows and they were good friends. In Among the Carrion Crows, Lyon shares her understanding of the cabinet appointment and it's quite revealing. She writes, quote, if the parliamentary grapevine was to be relied upon and I usually found it so, the new prime minister promoted me to cabinet rank with some reluctance. I have reason to believe that he regarded me as a useful public relations member of the party. But he had doubts of my ability to withstand the pressures of office. My heart would overrule my head. And he knew I was in very poor health. He may well have had other good and cogent reasons. It had taken some persuasion, I was told, to convince him of the wisdom of including me. And we're talking about Robert Menzies. Interestingly enough, Lyons received the offer of the cabinet position of Vice President of the Executive Council, not from Prime Minister Menzies himself, nor from one of her male colleagues, but by a phone call from, quote, the wife of one of the party hierarchy. Ever the pragmatist, Lyons recounts that she took the, quote, undistinguished ministerial post with practically no responsibility, unquote, because if she refused it, it would end any future chance of receiving a portfolio role which she may have ambitions for in the future. Upon reflection of her parliamentary career in the 1970s, Dame Enid Lyons recounted in an interview, that's both of them there arriving, quote, I've always felt that Dorothy never was given an opportunity to display her quality by the members of her party. I was in a much smaller party, whereas she was in the very large Labor Party and she was in the Senate. But even in the party room, she didn't get the consideration I got. And I know she was many times disappointed at the reception of some of her ideas, for instance. I just feel that Dorothy was a woman of quite marked ability she was a very popular member of her party and she had a study of finance of all things too. She lectured in economics. Lyon says, I heard not so very long ago while she was still in the Senate, a very highly intelligent man in Melbourne told me that he always liked to listen to Dorothy's speeches because they were so well reasoned and so well documented, but she didn't get on sorry, but she didn't get on to the inside running somehow of her party. And Dame Enid Lyons says, that seemed to me a great pity. It seems to be a common theme. Influenced by the suffering she witnessed during the Great Depression, Senator Tangney's areas of policy interest and priority were social services and education reform. At one point in her almost 25 years in parliament, she was serving on 23 parliamentary committees 
and sharing 13 of them. Needless to say, her strong and tireless work ethic would have been among the top of her Labor colleagues. A theme that runs through the history of the Federal Parliament, an interesting theme I think, is the contested definition and usage of the term feminist. Just as Vita Goldstein sought to distance herself from the shrieking sisterhood, the suffragettes of the 19th century, if you're wondering, so did Lyons and Tangney seek to make their name as a politician for all people in their electorate. And they made very pointed remarks, both of them in their maiden speeches about that. Although in contemporary times, we know that being a feminist does not involve focusing exclusively on women's rights and issues to the detriment of men's, at the same time, or at this particular time, it appears the term was unfashionable to say the least, and presumably both women, both women sought to reassure their electorates that they would be a local member for all citizens and a parliamentarian for all Australians. This is something that Dorothy Tangney wrote, and it was published in a newspaper. Quote, I want to make it quite clear that I am not a feminist in the sense that I consider women members should devote all their time to so-called women's problems. Elected by both men and women members, I consider I should represent equally both men and women. Both Enid Lyons, and Dorothy Tangney did not identify as a feminist. And upon hearing this, upon their election, it is said that Vita Goldstein was dismayed. Vita was a proud feminist. And yet, although they didn't want the label, these women were feminists. Everything they did was in the pursuit of equality, equality in rights, in legislation, equality of opportunity for women, equality in the home, equality in policy. And they did some really important things that they are not recognised for today. And unfortunately, I won't be able to go through them, so ask me in the questions. <laughs> but one I did want to mention, because I discovered it yesterday in a box at the National Library, was that there were clippings about something called the Equal Rights Blanket Bill of 1949. And this is essentially the first version of the Sex Discrimination Act, which we saw later in 1984. And this Equal Rights Blanket Bill was something of which Dorothy Tangney was pushing forward and seeking to get both the states and the federal parliament, the prime minister to support. I'll come back to that. I just thought I'd show you. So it's obviously big news. And I think it made the men feel a lot more secure. And it's interesting that in there it mentions a lot about children and the home and cooking and all the things that women understand better and will be able to present in Parliament because the men don't understand those issues. And that's the quote. Now I've got to go backwards. As I mentioned earlier, travel was one such challenge that women with a partner and or children faced more so than men. It is estimated that Senator Tangney travelled an average of 1,600 kilometres every week to carry out her parliamentary duties. Dame Enid Lyons faced similar challenges, especially as she was a mother of 12 children and a widower. She travelled from Tasmania on a ship full of soldiers, because this is World War II, 
and they were dodging mines in the ocean. So it was a risk to go to Parliament every time she had to go up there. Now I'm just showing you the uh, maiden speeches because I think they're also revealing of what's changed or not changed and how they presented themselves. But particularly how the media represented them. Dame Enid spoke from a bench at the back of the chamber, quietly, but with perfect enunciation and intonation, which carried her speech easily to all parts of the house. She combined charm of manner and gesture with the confidence and fluency of a polished speaker, which placed her amongst the bracket of really good debaters of which the House of Representatives possesses so few. <laughs> they don't have high views of the men there. Senator Tangney showed a little nervousness as she waited her turn to be sworn in, clasping her hands, but she took the oath in a firm, clear tone while her parents proudly looked on. And that's her being nervous. And Dame Enid Lyons was in fact bowled over by the response she got from the press about how wonderful her speech was. She was very surprised. And she actually wrote um, that she could barely speak. She said, for the first few sentences, I could barely enunciate my words. My lips were stiff. But every man there I felt, whatever his politics, was wishing me well. I was a woman standing alone, and they offered me kindness and chivalry. Words began to flow. I rallied my wavering forces and said what was in my heart. And what was in her heart is what I think is interesting about women in politics. And I don't want to make a generalised statement, but this is something which both women seemed to contribute. I'll read this out. Dame Enid Lyons says, right at the end of her speech, now honourable members, you will forgive me, I know, when I say that I bear the name of one of whom it was said in this chamber that to him the problems of government were not problems of blue books, not problems of statistics, but problems of human values and human hearts and human feelings. That, it seems to me, is a concept of government that we might well cherish. It is certainly one that I hold very dear. I hope that I shall never forget that everything that takes place in this chamber goes out somewhere to strike a human heart, to influence the life of some fellow being. And I believe this too with all my heart, that the duty of every government, whether in this country or any other, is to see that no man, because of the condition of his life, shall ever need lose vision of the city of God. They were both Catholic. The one thing that I think, though, to finish this speech, which I'm just going to get, and which you may be thinking about this entire time I'm speaking, I hope you are, is the fact that not all women got the right to vote and stand in Australia in 1902. Aboriginal women did not get the right to vote and stand for Parliament. Neither did their male counterparts. And for that fact, they weren't enfranchised to vote or stand for federal parliament until 1962. And it took until, in, until 2013 for Nova Paris to become the first Aboriginal woman to enter federal parliament as senator for the Northern Territory. She was followed by Linda Burney, who was the first Aboriginal woman elected to the House of Representatives two years ago in 2016. They were preceded by three Aboriginal men elected to federal parliament, Neville Bonner in 1971, Aidan Ridgway in 1999, and Ken Wyatt in 2010. Now, before I finish, I'm just gonna finish on a few thoughts and maybe you can think about it and if you have any questions, we can discuss it after. Um, there's an excellent exhibition which you may have been to at the Museum of Australian Democracy about these women and other women in Parliament. It's fantastic. 
Um, and there were a couple of quotes that I thought were revealing of how Parliament is like for women after these women and also now. Talking of Annabel Rankin, Annabel Rankin, an attractive and very feminine spinster, tries to battle it out with the males on a basis of complete equality. That was in The Sun in 1953. On Janine Haynes, she's just far too academic and dry and there's something just frigid about her. That was the Sydney Morning Herald in 1987. And it's not just the media, but politicians who might want to treat each other a bit kindly, which we hear about quite often. We heard things like, she's a menopausal monster, which was a caller to Alan Jones. Senator Bill Heffernan said to Julia Gillard, anyone who chooses to be deliberately, sorry, anyone who chooses to deliberately remain barren, they've got no idea what life's about. Well, Dorothy Tangney did never, never had children and she was a remarkable senator. And Tony Abbott said, am I to understand that when it comes to Julia, no doesn't mean no. That's the underbelly, but there are better parts. And thankfully, I can point out the instances because they don't happen every day. Helen Clark, who was a Prime Minister, female Prime Minister of New Zealand, I know I'm just making amends for the fact that I said they weren't good. <laughs> she says, fair representation and participation of women in governance is one of the preconditions for achieving genuine democracy. That is in her new book that's just been released. And the other thing which I think I'll end on and I think is quite um, important is that women must be drivers of development, not just passive beneficiaries of plans designed by others. So with that, I hope you've been inspired by some women and um, I'd love to have a chat about all of them or any of these questions and ideas that you might have. So thank you for listening. So I think um, Amy left us with a Dorothy Dixer, which would be interesting to know the answer to, but are there any other bids for questions? Could we have the answer to that one? <laughs> which one was that? So halfway through you said um, that there were a lot of um, important things that uh, the two of them had contributed that are not well acknowledged. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So many. Um, gosh, where do I start? I think, well, women, these particular women, and when they entered Parliament, they were talking about the war because it is 1943 and uh, the war still had two more years to go. And um, they said some very funny things, I think, um, which I don't even know if I've got the quotes for. It would be very funny if I can find them. But they were, they were I guess, highlighting the hypocrisy that was occurring at the time Women, particularly housewives um, who were working in their homes, unpaid, of course, um, were rationing on tiny amounts of food, tiny amounts of sugar, tiny amounts of meat, not particularly good cuts of meat, trying to feed families. And uh, the men in parliament did not want to stop wearing their waistcoats and they wanted to keep their buttons and they wanted to have extra fabric in their clothes. And all the women were, as Enid Lyons said, not wearing stockings, which is important because ankles don't look particularly good without them. It just looks like a joint, she said. <laughs> she says this in Parliament. <laughs> but um, she got very worked up about it. And she said, in fact, there has been a specially designed suit for men during the war, which is to save all the materials that we need to fight. This is a period of total war, which means all of our war resources are required. And it was, you know, a very intense war at that point. Um, and she basically pointed out that she saw no one except this one man who was behind the creation of the suit wearing it. 
I think it was something like a, a victory suit. I'd have to double check the name of it, but it was pertinent to the war. And, uh, and because she phrased it in such a funny way and in such a way that was um, making light of herself, but also then bringing it home to actually, I'm a, a wife or widow, I'm a mother, I look after my kids, I mend their socks, I cook their meals when I'm home. I have been doing my effort, why aren't you? And there were, that's a very small example of things that she would do and Dorothy would do on a daily basis. And I just love the fact and the delivery of it because it just is so revealing of the fact that she was loved by everyone and they were very jovial and she felt actually, this is what she said in her um, memoir, that she got along better with men than she did with women. She didn't have um, many female friends outside of parliament. And so, yeah, she, she had this great rapport with the men and yet, um, you know, she still had to use that kind of softly, softly approach so as to not bruise any male egos. And I think that's really uh, telling because people still do that today in many sectors. I still sometimes accidentally do it. It's somewhat socialised into women and also men. There are expectations socialised into men which are not particularly, um, you know, fitting for every kind of male and their personality and, and needs. So, yeah, but there were other things like... Um, Enid Lyons wanted to get through a, a family benefit, a bonus for every child born and they were looking to increase the population. They were concerned about people coming back from war and not being well. Um, and the, yeah, there was a de declining population um, and there were obviously racist undertones because we were fearful that the Japanese would invade and so that was a, a big thing hanging over people. And interestingly enough, and this is in her memoir as well, uh, Enid was approached by one of her male colleagues and said, oh, we've got this policy on the table and it's about getting, you know, giving um, families money for children. We've already drafted the budget. It's all been, you know, signed off, pushed away. This is a Menzies budget. So we don't want to, you know, do anything. It's going to totally blow out the budget if we put this policy forward. But we think it's a good idea. But unfortunately, we're men and it's not gonna pass if we bring it up in caucus. So they gave her these talking points and, uh, and she kept putting it on the agenda at caucus and they'd just end the meeting and ignore the bullet point on the meeting, the agenda. And she'd go, gosh, I'm getting a hint here. This is gonna be difficult. And so she said, I mustered like all of my effort. I thought of every possible point of opposition that I could think of that they would come up with. So she basically researched to the nth degree this policy and how it would work, how it would be beneficial for the economy, why it was absolutely vital, what it was going to do, how it would actually increase the population, all of these kind of things. And so eventually there's this last sitting period before Parliament ends. And uh, Menzies goes, great, we're 20 minutes early, let's all head off, possibly to the pub, I don't know. And, uh, and she's like, hang on a sec. And she stood up and said, Wait, what about my agenda item? And he's like, oh, oh, oh damn, okay. <laughs> you know, and everyone's you know, a bit scared of Menzies, apparently, that's what she says. Um, but he, he sat down and she got up and gave this speech and it was dead silent. The men would not say anything. There was no nodding, there was no smiling. There was like pro really kind of just blank slash a little bit serious staring going on in the room. And she was very put off by it. And she thought, I think I've completely lost this now. They're definitely not going to be on board and I've just embarrassed myself. And then basically, I think it was Harold Holt stood up, one of the men and also Harold Holt stood up in the room and said, that is an excellent idea. What an excellent idea, Enid. And then all these men, men after men stood up spoke as to why it was a fantastic idea and she was going I cannot believe this my idea which was our idea has never been so embraced by all the men and there was only one person who disagreed and one person who was on the fence and Menzies got up and was looking very disapproving and everyone kind of took a bit of a gasp because they didn't know what he was going to say 
And he was like, oh, you know, we can't do this. It's, the budget's already been settled. It's going to be very difficult to change this now. And, you know, it's a very pragmatic approach. They didn't want to blow out the budget. They had a surplus. It was all going well in their plan. And, uh, and Menzies put forward that point. And then more men got up and said, oh, well, we disagree. This is very important. And so they put it to a vote and it carried a nearly a full majority and Dame Maynard said that was the best moment of her parliamentary life because it was a moment when she felt like everyone was on the same page, that she put forward, you know, something which is a massive uh, budgetary item which would benefit families, mothers particularly, and their children, which was of very Im close importance to her, particularly child welfare and uh, single mothers, as well as Dorothy, certainly believed in that as well. And so, you know, it was very meaningful policy change for her. And, um, and it was really done with the aid of her male colleagues. And I think that was also a really great anecdote to me. But she, she deliberately put that in her book and outlined it in detail because that was the one thing she was most proud of and excited about and thought was a great achievement. So, yes. So I've cheekily stolen most of the time for questions, but is there one last bit? No, no, no. It's, no it was a Feel free to story. read the yeah. biography, though, because it's autobiography. Yeah. So just at the front here. Yeah, it's, I was going to actually talk about that, but I didn't have t enough time, so thank you for asking. Um, oh, so the question was, um, obviously, uh, Dame Enid and Dorothy Tangney were very well qualified. They were highly educated women. Um, you know, they'd had vocations. Uh, and what was it about the women prior who had run for federal parliament? Why did they not succeed? What made these women particularly special? Was it the time? the political circumstances. Um, and it was partly, I think, the war, um, because every major kind of social change tends to happen with a massive disruption of the fabric of society. And particularly the women in their maiden speeches spoke about the men and women who were overseas fighting and uh, serving in the defence forces. And that was something they pressed. And also the munitions workers who were women in factories. Um, so I think one of the things that Curtin said, and he rose in response to Enid Lyons to acknowledge her uh, speech, her maiden speech, is that he actually said, and this is quite useful if I can find it. I'll just have to paraphrase if I can't find it, but you can look this up. He said, um, here we go. Now I can't find it. Well, he basically said it's no coincidence that these women were elected during a war such as this. He, but it was one of the first things he said um, was that that's why he thinks they were elected. He said, there, here we go. Uh, that this great event in the development of Australian citizenship should occur during the greatest war that our country has ever waged is I think not a mere accident. It occurs because women as women and men as men have come to look at problems as problems. And he particularly tried to emphasise that uh, Enid wasn't there because she was a woman, she was there because the people who elected her deemed her to be the best person to represent them. So there was a great focus on, not only from the women themselves, but the men in parliament of de-gendering the situation. They were, I guess, they were marking the, the significance of the fact that women were there, but were trying to point out that it wasn't because they were women, which I don't think they probably needed to do because it took so long for them to get there. Um, but it was still, I guess, I think it was well-intentioned that they were trying to say you were there on merit. This was something that, you know, you deserve to be here, um, particularly because Dame Enid was so high profile as a, a public figure um, before she became um, the member. But the other thing I think about the other women before, um, most of the women who were elected and ran, but particularly the ones who were elected at the state level were 
um, conservatives of, of some form. Um, and particularly the ones who ran early were conservative. And I think that uh, is revealing of the educational disadvantages that existed between the working class and those who were um, you know, of, 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 an, of an upper class background, um, even the middle class. So there is definitely a class um, situation happening, um, particularly I think um, also a division between Catholics and Protestants. There were a lot of times when people wouldn't get pre-selected if they were a Catholic. They were asked whether they were a Catholic or not. Um, so all of those kind of deep divides and, and divisions which tended to um, boil over during the anti-conscription uh, debates and the conscription referendas in uh, 1916 and 1917, all of those issues I think were also then issues for women in terms of the divide that they had, the disadvantage that they already experienced. So there were plenty of women who were putting their hands up um, but they, and also people who said, for example, um, people who lived in the seat of Kuyong, that they were so glad that at least half of their electorate was enlightened because they voted for Vita Goldstein instead of um, the person who, who won. So, um, you know, there were, I guess, a whole range of reasons. But yeah, I think it was certainly the fact that women were in non-traditional non roles and that there were many, many men who were overseas <coughs> elsewhere and also that there was a record number of women who stood for election on that particular in that particular year which was 1943 Thank you. Thank you. but perhaps the written version might give you more scope to yeah. uh, we can hear <laughs> don't the tempt me it'll be a book in the end <laughs> um, you can hear the depth of the research that you've done and I think what for me what you've done is really put their election into the historical context so well but also brought some really human characteristics of the uh, um of them to us which um was entertaining too to boot so thank you very oh, much thank you. Will you join me in thanking amy thank you.